This is AML's virtual hearing webinar, and we're going to go through a real hearing uh, as much as possible on domestic violence and as a teaching example on how to do uh, hearing by video. And we're going to highlight through this teaching example differences or maybe non differences between doing a live in person hearing versus video. And AML is the sponsor of this organization. If you're not a fellow, you should take a look at, uh, this is a, a really some of the top family lawyers in the country um, and we're sponsoring this for free. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Chris Melcher. I'm a divorce lawyer in Los Angeles and I do trial and appellate work. Um, you're not gonna be able to see yourself in this view as Steve mentioned, because it's a webinar feature. So you're not gonna be able to see yourself. You can't see other attendees. We can't see you you can't uh, hear each other. So don't worry about whatever you're doing in the background, only the participants can see each other. Um, so what we've done here is instead of doing some boring PowerPoint presentation, we're putting this on as a, a mock hearing and we've built in a whole bunch of fails into this program. So things that could go wrong in a real video hearing we've built in or baked into this program. So we've asked our role players to do things that they probably wouldn't do if they were really conducting a hearing. And, uh, but it's just a way of a teaching example. And so there's gonna be objections to all these fails. There's gonna be rulings by our judge. And so that's the way we're gonna teach it. Uh, this will be available recorded um, on YouTube later on. We're not trying to prove anything, uh, whether DV happened or not. This is just a teaching example. So it's certainly not state specific. And we're gonna have to talk real fast because we're going through a whole lot. I'm gonna turn this over to Steve Mendel, but first I'll introduce him. Steve is running uh, FMBK in Los Angeles, it's about 20 lawyers. He's a friend, he's a mentor, he's just a great, um, a lawyer and also just an expert in marketing law firm management, really, really free with his time. So if you haven't connected with Steve, you should really do so. Great resource. Steve, go ahead. <laughs> and he's muted. He's muted. You're muted. How do you like that? Long there we go. <laughs> so technical issues. That's one of those built-in ones that Chris uh, talked about earlier. That was actually planned to do that, right? So I'm Steve Mandel, as Chris mentioned. Uh, Chris has introduced himself. Chris's partner, Steve Yoda, uh, is on, and Steve's going to be one of the attorneys uh, in the program today. Uh, my partners, Taylor Wallen and Alex Brager, are going to be the other two attorneys. Uh, and then a couple of our associates, uh, Tin Lee and Chelsea Stevens will be the husband and wife, I, I believe, and then, uh, or maybe uh, Cynthia is the wife, I guess. I guess uh, Chelsea is the, is the uh, witness. And uh, Cynthia Ponce and, uh, is uh, one of Chris's associates, uh, Walzer Melcher. And then just one other quick thing, as Chris mentioned, I like to do marketing. And so let me encourage everybody, uh, take a screenshot of this. Uh, post on LinkedIn, post on Facebook that you watch this because it's going to boost your reputation in the community that you're one of the top attorneys in the community that understands how to do a virtual hearing because this is coming your way even in Los Angeles where they said we will never have virtual hearings. We're going to have virtual hearings in Los Angeles. With that, let me turn it over to the program. All right. This is the case of Johnson versus Johnson. Appearances, please. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Steve Yoda of Walzer Melcher on behalf of the petitioner, Sally Johnson. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Taylor Wallen with FNBK as co-counsel for respondent Ted Johnson. Good right. afternoon, Your Honor. Alex Greger with FNBK for the respondent Ted Johnson. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Um, may I please have Ted and Sally Johnson stand where you are. Raise your right hand. Do you and each of you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Okay. Now remember, you need to speak into the microphones. Um, I would ask everybody to mute their telephones, uh, their iPads, any other communication devices, place them well out of the circle of where it is you are sitting. Um, I'm controlling the video conference uh, here, so I'm going to be reminding you um, if and when uh, we come across any uh, difficulties um, that we're live streaming also on YouTube this hearing. 
and um, and the court is recording it. I have a court reporter. Um, so at the moment, um, uh, let's uh, have the first witness uh, be called. Your Honor, before we do that, um, um, a respondent would like to lodge the following objection. Uh, Conducting this hearing by video, particularly with respect to a domestic violence restraining order hearing, violates the respondent's right of confrontation pursuant to the California Evidence Code Section 711 to the extent that this is a restraining order hearing and respondent has a right of confrontation and the hearing cannot be conducted in person. We ask the court to dissolve the temporary order, suspend this hearing and dismiss these proceedings. Your Honor, I, I agree that Mr. Johnson has a fundamental right to confront counsel. witnesses. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, uh, counsel, uh, we're seeing your mouth and your tie. Ah. Uh, and, and so please uh, take it easy, just as if you were in court. Thank you. you I apologize, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, I agree that Mr. Johnson has a fundamental right to uh, confront a witness, but that right to confront a witness in actuality is a right to confront a witness through cross-examination. Uh, and counsel has that very right right now as we speak. Counsel will be able to ask my client questions and confront her with impeaching uh, documents to the extent they have any, just like we were in regular court. Uh, I agree with you, overruled. All right. so. I've issued uh, rules and case management rules. We've had a pre-hearing conference, um, but I'd like you to remember certain things. Um, one, don't interrupt each other. Uh, it's difficult enough. And so if you wish to raise an objection, I'm gonna ask you to raise your actual hand. Uh, that way I can recognize you just as if you were in court. Uh, likewise, uh, I'm going to ask you that you, um, honor the fact that I'm keeping all of the microphones open. Uh, so if you rustle papers or make noise, you're going to disturb the entire video uh, process. So uh, kindly keep your desks uh, clean and, 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 and don't make noise. Um, and we will proceed, but cautiously and carefully. Thank you. Your Honor, I um, appreciate the court's comments. And there are a couple of other housekeeping matters before we proceed, and those are as follows. The answer to the court's question is, yes, we stipulate to the pretrial orders in the materials. However, we also request the following. Can the court please inquire of all witnesses if they are in the room by themselves, because we would like them to be in the room by themselves to avoid any coaching or reviewing outside materials? Um, all right. So uh, I think we have, do you mean the parties or just that we have one? Uh, let, let, let's, let's start with the parties. All right. So uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, are you by yourself in a room? I am. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, are you by yourself in a room? Yes. Thank you. And Your Honor, the next request is the witness exclusion order. I believe we have a third party witness who we ask to be excluded until they're called. They excluded until they're called. Miss um, Green, we're going to put you in your own special virtual room and ask that you wait there while we continue with the proceedings. And then we will call you back in just as if you were sitting in the courthouse hallway. So stand by and uh, the, we are going to place you in, your, in a waiting room. Thank you, Your Honor. And finally, Your Honor, uh, it is requested there be no communications between the parties and their attorneys off the record. Your Honor, I, I'm going to object to that. Uh, I have and should have an absolute right to speak to my client as her attorney, and she has and should have an absolute right to speak to me as her, uh, as her attorney, as, as my client. Uh, that's what the attorney-client privilege protects, after all. Um, I see nothing wrong or untoward about texting or emailing my client notes during these proceedings. Well, Your Honor, just, Mr. Yo Mr. Yoda might like believe, do in Mr. Court, Yoda might believe counsel, that there is nothing wrong with that, counsel, however. All the time counsel, each other. counsel. Uh, the court reporter will strike that last colloquy. I don't imagine the court reporter got any of it. And certainly when you're appearing in court, you're not sitting there texting your client next to you or shuffling and, 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 and whispering, which is really very bad form. 
So here we'll operate the same as in a real courtroom. If you wish a break to speak to your client, then we'll put you in a virtual waiting room and we'll all take a break. So that satisfies, I think, um, uh, b both, both attorneys' concern about uh, conferring with their client. Um, okay, so Mr. Yoda, you may call your first witness. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I call my client the petitioner, Sally Johnson. Ms. Johnson, you've previously been sworn. Um, make sure you answer correctly and completely. And if you have any questions, please let us know uh, if you're uncomfortable in any way. All right, Ms. Johnson, how do you know the uh, respondent, Tom Johnson? He is my husband. And you're seeking a domestic violence restraining order against him here today? Yes, I am. Briefly, uh, please tell the court the basis of your request. Mr. Johnson has stalked me. He's physically struck and shoved me. He physically destroyed my personal property. He falsely impersonated me online and generally disturbed my mental peace and calmness. I'm in constant fear that he's going to harass and abuse me. All right, let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. Uh, please tell the court what happened on the day in question. Well, on the day in question, I traveled to a hotel in Santa Monica to visit a friend. I did not tell Mr. Johnson where I was going. Mr. Johnson then texted me a little later, stating that he knew exactly where I was. And how did that make you feel? Scared, angry, and totally creeped out. Now, you mentioned that uh, you did not tell Mr. Johnson where you were going. Uh, was that a deliberate decision on your part? Yes. Why? because he has an extremely jealous and explosive personality. She's lying. Taylor, you're my lawyer, do something. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, in my courtroom, I have a, a lovely bailiff sheriff uh, who sits rather close to where the attorneys are at council table and where you would be were we in a courtroom setting. He would be walking over and standing over you right now with this type of behavior. And I don't think it's appropriate for you to be giving us, you know, what looks like testimony with your face by uh, grimacing. And, and, and uh, I ask that you uh, please uh, observe the decorum of a court hearing, even though you may be uh, somewhere uh, informal yourself. Uh, and do not speak unless uh, you've been called. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Now, Ms. Johnson, what, what were you saying before uh, Mr. Johnson's interruption just now? I was saying Mr. Johnson has an extremely jealous and explosive personality. You just caught a glimpse of it now. As you know, Mr. Johnson and I are separated. During our separation, I have been seeing another gentleman. I knew that if I mentioned this to Mr. Johnson, that he would explode with jealousy and rage. I realized that hiding this new relationship from him may not have been the most forthcoming of me, but I was genuinely fearful for my safety if he found out about it. All right, Ms. Johnson, I'd like to show you a document previously marked as Exhibit 1, and I'll share my screen so that all can see it. Do you see that there? Yes, I do. Uh, and I'll just scroll through, scroll through this so you can see the entirety of the document. Do you recognize this document? Yes, it is a series, it's a series of text messages exchanged between me and Ted on the dated issue. And were these uh, text messages exchanged while you were at the hotel in Santa Monica with your friend? Yes. Uh, your Honor, I'd like to move Exhibit 1 into evidence. Any objections? No, Your Honor, we met and conferred previously and uh, we've established foundation authentication, so no objections, so long as all four pages of Exhibit 1 are admitted. Thank you. They will be admitted. Exhibit 1 is in. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Johnson, I'd like to direct your attention to page 2, which I'll scroll to here. Do you see that? Yes. What does the text message at the top of the page say? It says, enjoying the Fairmont question mark. And who sent that? Mr. Johnson. And to whom was it sent? To me. Uh, what is the Fairmont? It's the Fairmont Hotel in Santa Monica, which is where I was at at that time. 
Now, did you ever tell Mr. Johnson that you were at or going to be at the Fairmont Hotel in Santa Monica? No, never. And how did this text message make you feel? As I stated previously, I was scared, I was angry, and totally creeped out. Now, do you have an understanding as to how Mr. Johnson knew you were at the Fairmont? Yes, I do. What is your understanding? I believe he wrongfully impersonated me to log into my Find My iPhone account to stalk me, just like the creep he is. And why do you believe that? Because if you look underneath his text message at the top of page two, you will see that he sent me a map of my exact location at the Fairmont Hotel using Find My iPhone account. Uh, yes, I see that. Let me direct your attention to the document previously marked as Exhibit Two. Uh, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. And what is this? It's a blow up of the Find My iPhone map in Exhibit One. And do you recognize generally what this is a map of? Yes. And what is it a map of? Santa Monica. Uh, do you see the blue dot, or I guess green dot on my screen, or a dot underneath the word Sally Johnson's iPhone? Yes. Uh, and is that dot where the Fairmont Hotel is located in Santa Monica? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I would like to move Exhibit 2 into evidence. Any objection, counsel? No objection. Exhibit 2 will be received. Now, Ms. Johnson, did you authorize Mr. Johnson to log into your Find My iPhone account to track your whereabouts on the date in question? No, absolutely not. And now just for the record, why were you meeting your friend at the Fairmont Hotel? To have lunch together. And, and what happened after lunch? After lunch, I returned home. Mr. Johnson was there. He was agitated and angry. Things were tense between us and we exchanged some sharp words with each other. I wanted to get out of the house as quickly as possible and away from Ted. So I decided to go out with a girlfriend in the evening for some food and drinks. So I started to freshen up and get ready for a night out. And what happened next? As I was leaving, I could tell that Mr. Johnson was still seething with anger. I can't remember what exactly he said or what exactly I said, but we exchanged more of the same verbal barbs that we've been exchanging between each other for months. And what happened next? He lunged toward me. Why? Because he wanted to see my phone. Did, did, his, contact, did his body make contact with your body? Yes. How so? He raised his left forearm and shoved it into my chest. At the same time, he reached for my phone, which was in my left hand with his right hand. Your Honor, Mr. Johnson is scowling and moving his body in a menacing manner. I don't, I don't know what the purpose of this is, but I believe it's to intimidate my client. I don't believe that's an accurate representation of Mr. Johnson's Mr. Yoda. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I've warned you once and we expect uh, uh, on a virtual hearing the same uh, decorum and professional uh, behavior as we do in a courtroom. And I understand that this is uh, a difficult and emotional subject for you, but your facial gestures and your bodily movements during uh, the testimony of Mrs. Johnson are out of line. And I'm warning you now, uh, I will place you on at least on mute um, uh, but y y your, your, your behavior is out of line and I would ask you to please contain yourself. Are you, your honor? Thank understand. you, your, thank you, your honor. Uh, Ms. Johnson, how did you react after Mr. Johnson, uh, shoved his forearm into your chest? First, the wind was knocked out of me. Then I sort of defensively pushed back against him with my right arm and try to retreat away from him. And what happened next? I didn't get very far because he grabbed on my arms with both of his hands and I tried to resist. During our physical struggle, my phone fell out of my hand and it broke, or at least the screen broke. All right. Ms. Uh, Johnson, I'd like to direct your attention to a document previously marked as Exhibit 3. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, do you see that there? Yes. Uh, do you recognize this? It's a picture of my phone after it broke. And does this uh, photograph fairly depict the, the, the condition after it fell out of your hand with your physical, uh, after the physical altercation with Mr. Johnson? 
Yes. And for the record, who took this photograph? My girlfriend. When? When I met up with her for dinner and drinks after I left the house. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to move Exhibit 3 into evidence. Uh, any objection, Ms. Wallen? Uh, no, Your Honor. I assume Mr. Yoda would be able to uh, quickly cure any foundational defects. So let us move on. No objection. All right. Uh, exhibit 3 will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, how did you and uh, Mr. Johnson react after the phone fell out of your hand and broke? Objection. Your Honor, objection. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was looking at my papers. Uh, uh, yes, objection lacks foundation, assumes facts not in evidence and compound. Sustained. What happened after the phone fell out of your hand and broke? When my phone broke, Mr. Johnson backed away from me. Our physical altercation stopped. I then told him I was leaving. I had to go meet my girlfriend. As I headed toward the front door, he tried to physically block me from exiting the house. What did you do? I physically pushed him out of the way so I could access the door. Did you push him hard? I wouldn't say hard, more like firm, just firmly enough so that I could exit the house. And how did this uh, physical altercation with uh, Mr. Johnson uh, near the front door make you feel? It made me feel scared, terrified actually. Mr. Johnson is larger and stronger than me. He's a fit man. For a moment, I was scared that I might die if the altercation continued uninterrupted. In a way, I should be thankful that my phone fell out of my hand and broke because this is what caused Mr. Johnson and I to physically separate from each other. Your Honor, move to strike everything. Excuse me, sorry. Your Honor, move to strike everything after it made me feel uh, scared as non-responsive. And Your Honor, may I be heard? Yes, just a minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Yoda. Uh, I, I asked how, how the uh, in a physical altercation made her feel, and I think her, her response was responsive to my question. Uh, the court will strike the second portion of the testimony. Uh, uh, in a way, I should be thankful that my phone fell and after that is gratuitous and non-responsive. Sustained as to that part. Now, Ms. Johnson, what happened after you left the house? I met up with my girlfriend for an evening out. And what is your girlfriend's name? Dorothy Green. And how did you feel as you left the house? I was still shaken up a bit and I felt that I would be safer with Dorothy. All right, no further questions, Your Honor. All right, uh, wish to call uh, the next witness. Um... Yes, Your Honor, I'll take the opportunity to cross-exam Ms. Johnson. Ah, of course. Ms. Johnson, immediately after uh, you left the residence, you went to be with your friend, Dorothy Green, right? Yes. And you claim that you were very upset the remainder of that night, right? Yes, I was very upset that night. Yet in reality, you were actually ready to party, right? Ob objection, Your Honor, vague, ambiguous, and argumentative. Overruled. Please answer the question, Ms. Johnson. Well, I had a planned night out with my girlfriend. Move to strike, Your Honor, as non-responsive. Sustained. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, you need to answer the actual question and, and not add anything extra, if you could. Yes. Do you need what? to hear the question again? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Wallen. In reality, you were actually ready to party, right? No. Okay. I'd like to uh, go to pre-marked exhibit 100, which is a one-page document of Ms. Johnson's uh, tweet. Moment. And Mr. Yoda, we have met and conferred on this exhibit. Uh, I'd like to offer exhibit 100 into evidence, Your Honor. No Thank objections. You. Any objection, counsel? No objections, Your Honor. Okay, 100 will be received. Uh, Ms. Johnson, after the incident, you claimed to be afraid of Mr. Johnson, right? Yes, very. 
And isn't it true that you sought a restraining order against Mr. Johnson because of your fear of him? Yes. Yet you were not afraid of him for purposes of going shopping with him just a few days after the incident, right? Ob objection, Your Honor. Of course, Mrs. Johnson was afraid. Shopping and fear are not mutually exclusive concepts. You can go shopping and still be fearful of someone. There's plenty of cases where uh, victims of abuse are more intimate with their abusers than just a shopping trip. Mr. Yoda, is that a universally recognized objection? Uh, I, I certainly hope it's compelling to the court. Uh, well, uh, uh, Mr. Yoda, you're out of line. Uh, kindly refrain from interrupting Ms. Wallen's cross-examination. Unless you have an actual objection, you need to state the grounds and then uh, be quiet so that I can rule. Your Honor, I would ask that the court take a negative inference based on the fact that Mr. Yoda just took the opportunity to coach his client. Uh, Your Honor, respectfully, I, I, I was not coaching. The, the, the line of questioning was just so ludicrous. Uh, I, I think uh, it was not coaching, Your Honor. I was just pointing out the obvious. Uh, the court will take note on credibility with respect to this entire hearing. Thank you. Move on, Ms. Wallen. Ms. Johnson, you were not afraid of Mr. Johnson when you asked him to grab a bite to eat with you just a few days after the incident, right? No, that's not true. Oh, can I talk to my attorney, please? Um, Mr. Johnson, you have interrupted again. Uh, and your lawyer can certainly um, uh, call for a break if once necessary. But right now, I'm going to put you on mute and keep you there until uh, it's your turn. And we'll be taking, obviously, our regular breaks because uh, the court reporter needs a break. So you will have the opportunity for a break uh, at regular intervals. Uh, so I'm reminding you that you are now muted. And please keep your facial expressions uh, um, somewhat... Um, uh, tone down. Thank you. Don't worry, Mr. Johnson. We'll take a break soon. I'd like now to introduce pre-marked and pre-exchanged Exhibit 101. This is Exhibit 101. Uh, Ms. Johnson, can you see this document? Yes. Exhibit 101 is a one-page document. It is text exchanges between the parties just a few days after the incident. I'd like to offer Exhibit 101 into evidence, Your Honor. Any objections? Your Honor, I have no objections, uh, except that I, I'd like to ask counsel to um, make the entire page fit on the screen, just so I can ensure it's the same document we've met and conferred about. Absolutely. Is that clear, Mr. Yoda? Yes, no objections, Your Honor. It'll be received. And Ms. Johnson, just to be clear, Whose messages are the messages that are in gray on the left-hand side? Mine. And on the right-hand side in blue, whose messages are those? Mr. Johnson's. Okay. Your Honor, I have no further questions of this witness. All right. Um, are we calling another witness at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Respondent Ted Johnson now calls pursuant to subpoena that was issued, uh, Ms. Dorothy Green. Okay, uh, Ms. Green, uh, welcome back. Uh, you've previously been sworn in. Um, just answer the questions directly, please. And um, I turn it over to you for direct. Your Honor, before we begin questioning, I, I'm going to object to this uh, calling of this wis, uh, of this witness uh, in its entire in her entirety. The counsel used a boilerplate subpoena to summons this witness here today, and the face of that subpoena uh, requires physical attendance in a physical courtroom, and as such, proper notice was not given. Your Honor, may I respond briefly? Please. The subpoena is a document by which a witness's attendance is commanded before the court. The subpoena requires a personal appearance to the extent that the court or the attorney through the subpoena has the power to summon the witness to appear and travel to a physical courthouse. Certainly, the subpoena has no less power to require a witness to log in to a website or to a virtual meeting on a particular date of time. The subpoena has the same effect irrespective of whether the witness has to travel to a physical courthouse or not. 
I, Mr. Yoda, I understand that the form has not been revised and probably council was loath to, you know, sh deface it and say video hearing. So um, I, I do believe our forms uh, will catch up to our virtual technology, but at the moment uh, the subpoena is valid and your um, objection is uh, overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Green, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, you're Sally Johnson's friend, right? Yeah, we're friends, yeah. On the night of the incident on June 1st, you spent time with Ms. Johnson, right? I did. You claim that Ms. Johnson was really upset that night immediately following the incident at her home with Mr. Johnson, correct? Yeah, she was absolutely devastated. You allege that Ms. Johnson was so upset that she was crying most of the night, right? Yeah, she was sobbing. And you further allege that Ms. Johnson was so upset that night that she couldn't even eat, right? Yep. I would now like to introduce, Your Honor, an impeachment exhibit. This exhibit will be marked as 103, um, and I will have my co-counsel email it to opposing counsel, the clerk, and the court and I'll simultaneously share my screen and give everyone a moment to review this impeachment exhibit. Oh, and I apologize. This is going to be marked as exhibit 102 as it is in the left-hand corner. It'll be so marked. Your Honor, I'm gonna to object to this document. This wasn't provided to us in discovery. This is a, this is a sandbag on us, Your Honor. Uh. Council, I, 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 I don't know that the term sandbag is uh, legally recognizable as an objection. Uh, I understand you haven't seen it before. It's not, it's being offered for impeachment only. Uh, the court will allow it. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Green, you have a Facebook account, right? Uh, Council, may I interrupt for a moment? Uh, I believe that uh, Ms. Green appears to be holding her telephone and texting. I was just about I, I was just about to raise that issue, Your Honor. I don't know if the court saw my raised hand because the court was probably looking at the exhibit and Ms. Wallen was probably looking at the exhibit, but I was looking at the screen and the witness clearly appears to be texting or otherwise looking at her phone. So I would ask the courts to instruct the witness to A, put her phone down and B, to perhaps move her camera in a way that we can see her hands to make sure that the witness is not looking at her phone or at other papers and is testifying truthfully. Um, Ms. Green, is there a way you can reposition your camera so we can see your hands or can you put your hands uh, up here uh, uh, so that we can see them while you finish testifying? Um, sure, I can move this out a bit and then if I do this, is that work? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you may continue, Ms. Wallen. Ms. Green, you were just texting Ms. Johnson just now, were you not? Well, yeah, I got a text from her, but she was only texting me about something that wasn't important. What were you actually texting about? She sent me a text message to tell me that she really liked the pearls the judge was wearing. All right, let's go back to Exhibit 102. I'm going to share my screen again. Screen, you have a Facebook account, correct? I do. And you posted, this is a, highlighting here in the upper left-hand corner of this exhibit, that is your Facebook account, Ms. Dorothy Green, right? Yes. And this is a picture that you posted um, on June 1st, correct? Well, yeah, that's what it says. Your Honor, may I ask that counsel uh, put the entire page on the screen so that the whole page is viewable? Thank Certainly. you. Certainly, Mr. Yoda. Good point. And Ms. Green, you took the photo that's posted here, correct? I did. And this is a photograph of Ms. Sally Johnson, correct? Yes, that's her. And this is in fact a photo of Ms. Johnson at approximately 8 p.m. on the night of the incident on June 1st, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Your Honor, I seek to admit Exhibit 102 into evidence. 
Any objections? Uh, I've already raised them and I believe I was overruled. So uh, in light of that, no objections. All right, uh, the exhibit will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions for Ms. Green. All right, uh, uh, will we be calling uh, Mr. Johnson to testify, counsel? I, before doing so, uh, or not at this time, while they take a break or it won't be necessary. All right, so we'll be in recess um, um, and uh, know that once we've uh, concluded this hearing, I'll be taking the matter under submission uh, so that I can review uh, both the video recording and the court reporter's recording. Um, uh, thank you all, uh, we're in break. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Well, that was um, our demonstration. I know we went like absolutely quick and um, we, we, we steamrolled all the rules of evidence and all the rules of procedure because we weren't trying to prove how to, how to do trial practice. We're really trying to show all the fails that happen in a video hearing and we pumped in a lot of them. There were great um, conversation here in the Q&A and chats. Um, and one of them was, would we have a court reporter and where would that person be? And absolutely, there would be a court reporter. Um, and some courts might have that person present in court, some part maybe have it remotely, but that would definitely be another role player. I played around with the, with the view. We, we were in gallery view most of the time, but then I went into speaker highlight view. So if you're using Zoom as a platform, that's you can see which one's best and everyone really hated the, um, the the highlight view of the speaker and they kind of preferred the gallery view. So that was something else. Um, there's been a whole bunch of questions about how do we deal with the exhibits? Should the judge be seeing them beforehand? Well, sure, if we, if we slowed it down and we did everything by the book, we would, we would be able to just have um, the, the attorneys view the exhibits via email, exchange those, see them without the judge being exposed to them. But if we followed all those formalities, that's why hearings take a day or two days and they don't take 30 minutes. Um, so again, we had to go through there. Uh, you know, Taylor uh, showed the one question too many and I instructed her to do that. So she would have never done that in real, real life, but it was absolutely killer evidence. We could see the texting and, um, and it was hard for Taylor as the, as the examiner to see that. And I've noticed when I've done video hearings, you get in the moment, you're thinking about stuff, you can't see the Brady Bunch view and everything's doing, but co-counsel saw it, the judge saw it. And it was a killer line of questioning, like, hey, you were texting, you were texting Sally, yes, we would have left it right there and let that sit in, but it was the one too many. What were you texting about? Oh, the judge's pearls. Uh, um, hey, before, Steve? Before you, um go any further. This is a great time because like right now we have almost 300 people watching the program. So if you have a, a question that's just burning a hole in your pocket, uh, be sure to send it in to us right now because we want to address them. And one thing that when I introduced all of the people, all the panel, the, the key person that I didn't introduce was Commissioner uh, Gretchen Taylor. And uh, Commissioner Taylor and I have known each other since when, when Commissioner Taylor was actually a practicing family law attorney. Uh, before she became a judicial officer and is now retired. And for those of you who are out of the state, uh, you may or may not have heard that we have a very active uh, uh, retired judicial judge program uh, where uh, our retired judges are available to do mediations and trials and uh, do special assignment work. And Commissioner Taylor is one of our premier judges uh, for doing our uh, private private programs. So anyway, just wanted to make sure I got that announcement out, Chris, before the 270 participants start dropping off. So thank you, Commissioner Taylor, for taking the time and the effort to do this today. And of course, we love your pearls. Thank you. And um, uh, Commissioner Taylor, do you, what, what were your observations on, on doing this um, remotely versus a live hearing? Well, I, I, I think, and I still, um, feel this way even about Zoom uh, mediations and other Zoom calls. I think it's disconcerting to be looking at yourself all the time. Uh, you know, it's as if we're sitting here with mirrors, um, you know, and, and, and the double, you know, double rows of boxes 
Uh, so it's you, you, your eyes kind of glaze over. And uh, from a judge's perspective, um, I kind of missed, uh, you know, honing in on the witness. Um, and maybe in a real hearing, I would have only had the witness's view and the camera would have gone back and forth between uh, the attorney and the witness. Um, but I do find it um, somewhat difficult to, you know, like I missed, uh, you know, an objection there for a moment, and yet you don't want people having to interrupt. Um, so I think practice will help as well as maybe continued modification of these tools, which, which will be more, um, you know, sort of crafted by all of us as we keep using them and, and learn ways that they should be modified. Chris, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is something that's available on Zoom, but I suppose one technical way to do it is if the judge has two screens, the judge could potentially see the exhibit or the screen share on one screen and actually see the witness or whoever is speaking on the other screen. Because I understand and I agree with Commissioner Taylor that having a document in the big picture and having a bunch of little squares on the right does not give the judge what they otherwise would see in the courtroom. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, Alex, one of the really important takeaways that we have from this is technology, right? So if you're doing this with a uh, privately compensated judicial officer like Commissioner Taylor is now, you can provide them in advance, you know, like we do in trial, right? When you go to trial nowadays, you bring five iPads. So you could provide a different iPad for the judge to have all the exhibits on the iPad. But one of the complications, Alex, that a lot of people are commenting on is that uh, how do you actually deal with the exhibits? Because remember, the court clerk is dealing with the exhibits. And so Larry Moskowitz, uh, one of our fellows from Northern California, good buddy of ours, uh, just posted a, a nice little comment on there about that, that you know, providing the electronic versions of the documents in advance, with the exception of what we call in California sub rosa evidence, you know, that secret evidence that comes in, uh, when you're going to be doing your video trials, it's just critical that you get all of the exhibits pre-authenticated and all that cooperation stuff that we hear about uh, works really, really well with video trials. So one, one of the things that we're going to see, it, this is just Steve Mandel's projection on this, is that uh, video trials are going to make us much more efficient in the way that we try our cases, which will reduce the fees to the overall clients and will increase the probability that we all get paid a very important function that we have as lawyers. And uh, Steve Yoda, any observations? Um, not, I, I mean, honestly, I, I miss the courtroom. I think the courtroom is, there is no substitute, you know, uh, to stare down a witness or kind of, you know, use physical space to kind of make the witness uncomfortable and squirm. But, you know, I, I think Zoom trials, good enough to get the job done. Uh, that, that was sort of my experience here. Uh, but, but I do think there is a magic that happens when you're physically in the courtroom, physically looking at, at the witness, either on direct or cross, right? On direct, you kind of draw out the emotions more. On cross, you can make the witness feel a little uncomfortable um, and squirm a little bit. I think that's harder to do on Zoom. But, you know, for, for day in, day out administration of justice, eh, this probably gets the job done. Well, and, and in, my, in my pretrial orders, they would include that parties are not allowed to record uh, the proceedings informally uh, or take screenshots or uh, otherwise uh, make a record other than the official record. And, and I put that into my mediation documents as well. No recording. And uh, Alex, any observations? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with Steve that, you know, I don't think there is a substitute of being, you know, in the same room with the witness. And I also saw a lot of comments on, you know, in the chat about, you know, a lot of people were frustrated by my objection that there be no communication with the client because, because our uh, audience, of course, is correct that when you're sitting next to your witness, uh, next to your client, rather, you can whisper something in someone's ear or you can pass a note. But I think the virtual hearing makes it a problem because there can be real coaching going on, right? Because in the courtroom, the judge sees whether the communication is brief and whether a note is passed 
whereas online there is really no protection from getting information, not even necessarily from a lawyer, but from someone else, from an assistant, looking at a document, making sure something is scripted. And I think, um, you know, all testimony, you know, veracity is important, but especially in restraining court or hearings, I, I think it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. And if okay. I could just build, if I could just yeah. build on that, I mean, I, I think that this whole note passing, you know, it's, it's a very mundane, but I think it's also a very profound issue that we're going to all have to struggle with. I don't know what the right, right answer is, but, you know, I, as I tried to say when we were talking over each other uh, during the objection, you know, it happens all the time. You, you pass notes. If anything, notes from my clients sh sharpens my questioning and makes the presentation and advocacy better it makes a better record and makes a better story and narrative for the judge so i don't know what the right answer is with this technology but you know notes from clients can be helpful during examination yeah and i think one of the things and taylor will get right to you on this is on the coaching and that's a lot of the naysayers say but i've seen coaching of witnesses by attorneys right on the stand and live hearing uh you know every time I, I pointed out the judge hasn't seen it but i've absolutely seen that happen so uh, I don't think we're immune to it um, in a video. Uh, Taylor and then Commissioner Taylor. Taylor Wallen have, and then Commissioner. <laughs> I've got uh, two points to address. And one is the, the communicating with your client. It's obviously one thing to communicate with your client when your client isn't on the stand testifying. Um, so like, well, for example, when I was cross-examining um, Cynthia, which is Sally Johnson, I would like the ability to chat with Ted Johnson. And I think that one of the things we can ask as, as attorneys for case management orders is to have a chat program available to us, like Slack, for example. I like Slack. It's really easy to use. Um, and I could be chatting with the client. And then when my client goes on the stand, we can agree to turn off the chat program uh, or other case management orders, possibly. I've been seeing lots of questions about how to share or how to um, manage the exhibits when there's lots of exhibits. And so um, I want to share my screen real quick just to show a basic um, how to maintain them. And so this is just my, uh, some of the art exhibits right here, all ready to go loaded up. And I do recommend that you have these exhibits on your actual desktop program that you're using, your laptop that you're using. Don't rely on having a Dropbox or a share file that might log you out because if you have to log in, it's kind of cumbersome and slows everything down. Um, and then when you have an exhibit, have it bait stamped with exactly whose exhibit it is, what the exhibit number is, um, and the page numbers so that you can keep track of these things. And then I think it would be very helpful when you have an impeachment exhibit um, to have either co counsel or an assistant on the ready to immediately email it out as you also uh, share screen because it's hard. If you are a solo counsel handling the trial alone, it's hard to email the impeachment exhibit out to multiple people and put it on your share screen and go back to your notes uh, to continue asking questions. So I think it's, as Steve Dell already mentioned, it's gonna require lots of extra organization, but it's very doable. You, you know, one of the things that Taylor was talking about, which is sharing your screens, but the other thing is sharing the program on YouTube, right? So our courts in California are public courts. Not every state is public, um, not, uh, so our trials are public trials. So it's pretty much anticipated when our uh, LA Superior Court comes online with their program that you'll be able to just turn on YouTube and watch Department 65 all day long uh, because the trials are not private, they're public. And if, you, if the public's not allowed in the courthouse, then the trials will have to be on YouTube. So there was, there was a whole bunch of questions about that uh, that's kind of state specific and with the 260 people from every different state who has different rules on privacy, uh, I'm sure that every state's going to be slightly different, but you can be assured that in California, uh, our trials are public. And on, on that point, and Alex, I'll hit to you right there. Um, so what Texas is doing is using Zoom webinar platform, just like we're doing right now. And the only participants that can go into their are the, the parties and the attorneys and witness just like we've done right here. And then they live stream that feed to YouTube 
And so the public can watch that um, and it's not recorded. It's just there at the moment on live. And then uh, each department has its own YouTube uh, channel. And so there's a link standing link there. So if you wanted to go on it, you could check it out. Texas way ahead. And that's the way that they're providing that. One other thing, Alex, before I get to you, is there a lot of questions about, well, the attorney and client being together, obviously that objection and ruling bothered a lot of people. Um, however, the court's going to do it is fine, but you have each person has to have their own video camera and log on separately. You can't have, you know, two people there uh, sharing one camera because it's going to be very difficult for the court and the court reporter to know who's talking. Just like I'm talking now, I'm being highlighted somehow. Probably you could see my name at the bottom. So everyone has to have their own thing. Alex, go ahead. So this is exactly what I wanted to address because I see in the Q&A, not in the chat, a couple of comments that I think are perfectly appropriate, which is what is the reason that a party and their attorney cannot be together in the same space, let's say in the attorney's conference room. So I heard what you just said, Chris, but let me ask you, what is the problem with me and my client being in the conference room in my office and being on the same video feed, which the judge would be able to see just as if we were sitting next to each other in a courtroom? Why would that be inappropriate or inadvisable? So there was um, a, a comment about that just now about feedback. And so um, I don't think there's anything procedurally wrong with it, but technically uh, those microphones uh, uh, would probably pick each other up and could feed back. So I think some, some physical separation is going to be important. One thing we didn't cover because we, you know, is, is about equipment and you'd want to have, a, you know, a standalone microphone. You can get a USB microphone and plug it in. Don't rely on the little tiny hole in your computer. Um, same thing with, are you going to use the speakers on your computer? Are you going to use earbuds or earphones? Have some nice lighting like I have here. Uh, pay attention to your background. We spend a lot of time, uh, if we're going to court, what, we're, what our physical appearance is going to be, the clothing that we wear. Well, we're being judged uh, on video just the same way. So if we look like a wreck on video, they're going to say, you know, look, uh, we don't like watching you. It's frustrating watching you, but also it's, it's a cue about your competency. If you can't figure out the video, then maybe the judge infers that you can't figure out your case. So this is something you can learn. You can go on YouTube, how to look better on Zooms. There's a million videos on there, a million, uh, a, a lot of equipment that you can get on Amazon for cheap. So I'd encourage you to do that. And if you need any help with it, let me know because I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that stuff. And uh, so uh, Steve, any, Steve and Dell, any, any final thoughts on your end? And you're on mute, by the way. Yeah, let me unmute myself. Yeah. That's always helpful. So a lot of really good comments coming on the q and I'm not sure if everybody's watching it. I see Rod Feruzzi up in uh, the, the Bay Area up in San Jose uh, just uh, sent us a little message about, you know, a lot of people talking about the physics of the trial. You know, well, why didn't you have the witness hold the telephone up so you could read the text message? Yes, of course, all of those things happen in a real trial. But, you know, when Chris and I designed this program, we said we had about 35 minutes to put on a hearing. And so all we wanted to do is show you somebody whose face is up in the microphone and so forth. So, so the, these are all really uh, important things. One of the things I will tell everybody is look at the attire of everybody here. Okay, so you've got Steve Yoda. He's the attorney. He's in a suit and tie. Looks really good. You got Alex Greger in a suit and tie. The judge is all professionally dressed and very judicial. Um, Taylor Wallen, an attorney, is a suit and tie. And now all of a sudden we've got our client, uh, Tin Lee, the husband, who's the wife beater and he's wearing the crappy t-shirt and he's jumping up and down and he's screaming and yelling. So, you know, all those things that we have to do to prepare our clients for a court appearance, we got to do the exact same things for these video appearances. And my recommendation is going to be something like this. Uh, get a recording of, of a program like this so people can see what it's going to be like in the trial. Uh, or, or develop programs within your office to put somebody on video, use Zoom, use WebEx, whatever system that your court is using, and then record your client, how they testify, how they look, how they sound. Uh, get the big bully in your office to do the cross-examination of your client. Embarrass them, make them scream and yell. Do all the things that 
uh, we would, you know, think about doing for a court appearance that we might not do. So, you know, my hot tip of the day is going to be, this is a unique opportunity. Uh, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. Uh, and when we teach little kids, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll videotape them and then we'll show them back what they just did. And it's incredibly insightful to people because they can see what they look like. So my recommendation to everybody, my big hot tip for the day is going to be to make sure that you videotape your client in this situation, put them on the hot seat and see how they respond. So just a quick hot tip on that. So we're going to wrap this up. This is going to be on YouTube. I was live streaming it earlier, but I stopped because I, I was having some all technical difficulties. But in about two days, it's going to be on YouTube. You go there, you search for my firm's uh, channel, Walzer Melcher LLP. So you just type in Walzer Melcher in YouTube. It'll come up in about two days. It'll be there for free to watch. If you're involved in local bar organizations and you want us to put this on for your organization, let us know. We're happy to do that. Um, please connect with all of us on LinkedIn. It's a great platform to uh, share ideas. I'm getting um, information from all over the world on other courts that are doing remote videos. We've shared some of that stuff in, in YouTube. There's even a UK court opinion on whether it's appropriate in family law to do video hearings. So LinkedIn's a great place. Please go there if we're not already connected up and do that for all of us. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to go ahead and close the webinar off now. Oh, unless before you, sure. before you close up, one last word. To the extent that you saw things that you think we could improve on greatly, can you do me a favor? Uh, Chris and I, we're, we're both very public. You know, you can go, you can Google Chris Melcher, Steve Mendel, go to our website. You'll catch our emails. Send us an email and tell us what you thought we did really well on this and what you thought that we could improve on. Uh, because we are going to be doing this program again. I assume we'll probably do this for LA County Bar, maybe San Diego, a couple of the other bar associations. And then for those of you who are AML fellows, uh, Chris will have this loaded up on the AML website, but it'll be behind the wall. So you'll have to be a fellow in order to watch it on the AML website, but you can always go to Waltz or Melcher and uh, pick it up off of their YouTube channel. And again, thank you to all the participants, especially to Commissioner Taylor, um, you put in a ridiculous amount of hours on this. Uh, I wasn't just to show up today and do this. You had to sit through a crazy number of uh, meetings before we got this thing up and running. So we appreciate all your time and efforts. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.